Salim Mansur is our guest today, and today we're going to be visiting three sensational trials that have reached verdicts in the United States within the last three or four weeks. And Salim has a particular point of view that he wishes to express that some of the other uh, pundits out there are, are missing. Because all three of these trials have um, elements in common, most particularly that they are used by the left as vehicles to further their agenda. That agenda, of course, the false narrative that the United States is inherently a racist country. And uh, the three trials are, uh, very quickly, because um, you can look these up and they're very popular, so most people would be familiar with them. The uh, Kenosha, Wisconsin, Kyle Rittenhouse trial, which reached a verdict on November 19th, acquitting Kyle Rittenhouse of uh, murdering two people, injuring another. Uh, the uh, Glynn County, Georgia, Greg and Travis McMichael and William Bryan trial, all three accused um, with uh, murder or charges similar, felony murder, of Ahmed Arbery. And you may want to look that one up. That has not been as publicized as the others. And of course, the last one is uh, Jesse Smollett. Jesse Smollett uh, being the liar, huckster, hoaxer that he was, proven in court of law that he uh, perpetrated a hoax on the good people of Chicago and the United States, claiming, of course, that two white supremacists beat him up uh, wearing MAGA hats. And by the way, I think that, that one feature alone, that these were Trump supporters, should uh, give him his sentencing that much more weight, because that to me is domestic terrorism. That is an attempt by Smollett to influence the election, because this happened on January 19th of 2019. And of course, the, uh, the verdict came down just December 9th, a couple of days ago, where he was found guilty of, uh, guilty of felony disorderly conduct and lying to police. So, Salim, all three have elements of racism by the mainstream media and the, um, the left. All three have um, basically, have uh, the, the juries, and these were all jury trials, all came back with what I would consider to be fair judgments. What's your take? Yeah, um, Bob, Robert, again, thank you uh, uh, for getting me to talk about these uh, three trials. Uh, they took place in different points of time over the past couple of years. Um, Juicy Smollett uh, case was one uh, that goes back to January of 2019, as you have pointed out. <clears throat> Uh, Kyle Rittenhouse case goes back to <clears throat> the summer of 2020 um, in the uh, situation post uh, Floyd uh, death at the hands of the police officers and that trial too is open to mm -hmm. various you know uh, consideration given the context of what has happened uh, in the three trials that you have mentioned and Ahmed Arbery case goes back to again the post Floyd situation <coughs> in Georgia. <coughs> Excuse me. So these trials uh, that happened, um, uh, or, or rather the decision that came down, the trial was held in the month of November, and the decision came down one after the other over the past three to four weeks, as again you have pointed out, together uh, opens a window uh, in trying to make some sense or some way to understand the tumult that American politics is going through, which affects, of course, the criminal justice system, which is at the heart of much of this discussion in America on the basis of the narrative that has been pushed uh, not only recently over the last four or five years uh, with the Trump presidency, uh, in 2017, inaugurated in January 2017, but it goes back several decades, you know, uh, the whole idea uh, that 
has gathered momentum and has possibly reached uh, a peak in this political climate that we are going through uh, since the November 2020 election and everything that preceded the November 2020 election in America, that America is a systemically racist country. <clears throat> and given that it is a systemically racist country, <clears throat> The minority population in America, particularly the black population in America, cannot and does not receive fair justice. So that's the narrative. That's the narrative that has been pushed by the mainstream media. It is a narrative that is pushed by the principal educational system right across the country. Critical race theory has now become the framework through which all the discussion is taking place in schools and colleges in the United States, again, over the past several years. And so in the context of that framework and state of mind that has been created, the narrative, uh, there's a 1619 project that was launched by the New York Times, that the foundation of America is racist. You know, it is not 1776. It is not about the pursuit of life, liberty, uh, and, and the pursuit of happiness, that it is about a country that was born as a result of slavery, founded upon slavery, and that, that relationship continues in so many different ways, which is what systemic racism is about. So given that background, um, Robert, <clears throat> the decision of the, uh, the jury pool in Chicago, in Waukesha, uh, Wisconsin, and in Georgia, uh, goes flatly against that narrative because the narrative is pushed by the elite in America, <clears throat> the editorial opinion writers, <clears throat> professors, uh, and uh, the politicians in the Congress, particularly the Democratic Party and all its allies from the president down, uh, this is the narrative. And given that narrative, you have the judgment coming down by a jury pool uh, made up of common American citizen from the community where the trial is being held, where the crime took place. And in all three cases, it has been uh, not a hung jury, not a divided jury, but a unanimous verdict of guilty, guilty, guilty on just about every count. And we can go through each of the cases, but right on the top, I would say <clears throat> that what this is indicative that the elite narrative is one that is being pushed, but it hasn't, being bought by the common people. The common people live the life daily in conditions in which you and I live, trying to negotiate our way in a society that is multi-ethnic, uh, multi-faith, uh, people of different backgrounds, immigrant communities, um, and, and so on and so forth. And, and the people don't see America in this instance through the prism that America is a systemically racist country. You know, as a matter of fact, the, uh, the uh, welfare media, as I like to call them, because they receive government funding, at least in this country, Canada, not so much in the United States, but the legacy media, the drive-by media, as Rush would have said, the uh, mainstream media, which has become the catch-all phrase for, for them, do not reflect, in my estimation, uh, main, main Street America. And uh, one thing to drive that home, not just in the United States and Canada, but also in Europe, for example, would be the massive protests that are happening on the streets against uh, the measures by governments during this pandemic. And you would have upwards of a million people out there in the streets protesting. In the media, crickets, nothing. It would not be covered. That should tell people that there is a disconnect between the reporters, the, the press, which by the way, the press is just owned by a handful of companies and CEOs in the United States and in Canada, and the people. But when you get down to it with these trials and you get a jury pool, which is reflective of the demographics of the 
venues that these crimes have taken place. For example, in Chicago, it's a, basically one-third white, one-third black, one-third Hispanic. And the juries reflect that. And they all come back. And they let Kyle Rittenhouse off as an acquittal because he was defending himself. So, there, so all three of these cultures, these, these races, recognize the Second Amendment, not like the mainstream media, which does not. And then you have the, um, the other cases, Jesse Smollett, and um, they find him guilty as it was so uh, prima facie guilty. <laughs> Everybody knew he was guilty way back. And then the, um, the Ahmed Arbery. Now, that's the case of a black man who was seen in this white neighborhood going into an abandoned house under construction, then coming out and surveillance video show he didn't steal anything, and yet he was in this neighborhood. And Well, that's fine. You can be in a neighborhood anywhere you want. And uh, continue on his jog. A couple of uh, good old boys hopped in their pickup, wondering what this black man was doing running through their neighborhood, and tried to make a citizen's rest unwarranted. Um, Mr. Aubrey struggles. They shoot him dead with shotgun blasts, two to the chest and one to the arm. And there was a, an element there of probably favoritism, allegations that the district attorney, apparently, who had a professional relationship with one of the shooters, didn't press charges. Then the video of it goes viral, and then, of course, the attorney general has to come in and revisit it. A jury is selected, they find them guilty. And so the people's court versus the media's court are two distinct things in the United States. There is a disconnect. I imagine you would agree with that. Yes, uh, yes, Robert. I mean, the details that you have spelled out on the Arbery case is, you, you know, uh, quite revealing and, and quite interesting. Um, and so we can get into the granular detail, but the point here is that um, this young black man, uh, Albert Arbery or Ahmed Arbery, a 25 year old young man, he did have a rap sheet, but that rap sheet did not bring about for some minor, minor trespassing or minor issues, Probably. did not lead to any indictments against him, any charges of felony and so on and so forth. So he was innocent man who was doing what he has been doing, according to the reports, jogging through a neighborhood that happened to be a white majority neighborhood. He had been spotted previously by the three people, father, son, and the neighbor uh, in that um, building that was either broken down or was under construction and so on and so forth. And, and Arbery had been spotted running by that building or through that building, but there was never any uh, accusation made about uh, Arbery was going through there looking for things or stealing things there was no such accusation and and so on this particular day um it was vigilante justice you know citizen arrest and vigilante justice being meted out to an arbory uh, almost unilaterally by uh, three white men you know uh, father and son moved on their pickup truck followed by the neighbor who came behind them and then they accost him and in the scuffle uh, he was shot dead. And as you noted, that uh, there might be, and that I think the story is not fully closed on that matter, there might be some sort of a connection between the local police uh, force and the prosecutor that did not bring uh, any indictment till the Georgia Bureau of Investigation got involved on the instruction of the Attorney General, and then the case was taken out justice delayed is justice denied. So there was a delay in, in that justice till the Bureau of Investigation came on. And again, in the context of that narrative, people might, or some people might draw uh, inference that um, the local police or the local prosecutor was trying to protect the white against the black. And, and then the, the black uh, argument is that, you know, uh, a black man is more often stopped by the police on the basis of 
suspicion that a crime has been committed and uh, and that that was the suspicion behind everything that happened that led to the eventual mortal shooting lethal shooting and and the death of this man arbery this young man and the fact that the justice was delayed the matter was not taken up immediately that there had been a death and therefore it needed to be investigated and and and, and charges brought whether it, it it was an accidental yet death or self defense as what happened in the case of Carl Rittenhouse or whatever the circumstances needed to be explored but that was delayed and so the suspicion remained but eventually a jury pool as you point out a jury pool of basically a majority white jurors um came down with a unanimous verdict of felony and manslaughter or or murder um th that that will put these people away for a long time unless they themselves are uh, uh, given death pe death penalty uh for a crime committed especially by the son um uh who shot the man uh, comes to the conclusion that a white jury pool uh, found three white men uh, guilty as charged of murdering a black man. You know, uh, this fact runs counter to the narrative that has been pushed. You know, so that has to be established. Similarly. In the case of Carl Rittenhouse, you know, we, we, we know the context that in the summer of 2020, America was burning all the way into the capital, Washington. And it was burning as a result uh, of decisions that were made and, and, and levers that were pushed in support of Black Lives Matter, BLM and Antifa in the context of that these people came out on the streets um, in a time and circumstances when America had gone into a shutdown and a lockdown due to COVID. And, and then under the rise that happened and particularly in the blue states, in Portland, Oregon, in Seattle, Washington, in, in Baltimore, in Maryland, in the, um, uh, places like Kenosha, Wisconsin, uh, Minnesota, uh, these Atlanta, Georgia, these were places with extremely troubled population and predominantly a black population. These are the population in, in the urban centers, which has a large concentration of black Americans. Uh, and there's Chicago and New York, uh, you know, so uh, including the capital, Washington, D.C. So this was the situation. And then there was the death of George Floyd who has been made into some sort of a secular saint dying in the hand of the police officer. Uh, and, and there's a whole question that hangs with a Dick Chauvin, uh, the police officer uh, indicted and found guilty of, of uh, suffocating uh, George Floyd, got a fair trial. Um, <clears throat> So it is in that context that uh, Carl Rittenhouse uh, event took place. I mean, the young man uh, was in, in um, Kenosha, Wisconsin, uh, that he had gone across the state line. Uh, he was 17 years old at that time. Um, he was carrying a gun, he was armed. And he fell in a, into a situation where he fired his gun he had gone in there to protect uh, property that was under threat of being burned down, uh, property in which there was some family connection or friend connection. But he found himself in a situation surrounded by people who were in engaged in uh, burning and looting uh, that threatened his life or was threatening his life and he fired in self-defense. That is what he claimed. That is what ultimately the video that was shot proved. And uh, and he was he was charged with uh, manslaughter, um, and and the case that took place, and and then eventually um, he was fully um, acquitted on the basis of uh, self-defense. 
Uh, and again, it was a jury pool from the community, uh, 12 men and women who, despite the immense pressure created by interested parties that were pushing this narrative and are pushing this narrative, the BLM, the Antifa, the Democratic Party, and so on, um, uh, Carl Rittenhouse was fully acquitted. And then the case of Juicy Smollett is the most interesting one. It goes back to 2019, January. I mean, what was happening in 2019, January? I mean, that what was happening in 2019, January was the Russia, Russia hoax, and then the Ukrainian hoax about President Trump had exploded uh, on, on the national scene with impeachment of the president. That is an impeachment of the president on the basis of a hoax uh, that the Democratic Party brought against Donald Trump. Uh, and eventually Donald Trump was acquitted, but in, in, in the in House of Representatives, the, the impeachment vote was uh, a majority vote that took him into the Senate, where the Senate sits as a court to decide on impeachment. So that is the backstory around or about in the context about which uh, we need to understand or discuss the Juicy Smollett case. And the Juicy Smollett case turned out to be a hoax, but it turned out to be a hoax in the court when people, when it happened and when it got reported, smelled a rat that this was a hoax. That on a cold, polar cold night in Chicago in January of 2019, at 2 a.m. Chicago being one of the most democratic city in all of the United States, a city which voted twice for its uh, citizen, Barack Obama, as the president, a city in which the mayor is a black woman or transgender, I'm not quite sure how now we can define her. Uh, the chief of police is a black man. And as I said, I repeat myself, a highly democratic city. And you see Smollett, a, a black man who I understand is a gay man, um, goes out and claims that at 2, 2 a.m. in the morning, he was confronted by two people and he called them white. They, they were wearing ski masks. So presumably that's the argument that he couldn't see who they were, uh, but he saw some sort of indication that they were white, but they were wearing MAGA hat. At 2 a.m. in the morning, somebody wearing that, two people wearing MAGA hat in a democratic city um, is itself uh, unbelievable, but there it was and that he was to be lynched. He was roughed up and was going to be lynched. And then he ran away. And the whole thing smelled of a rat. But what it goes to show is that uh, this man, and then those who came out in support of him, the Hollywood people, the, the media people, including at that time, the vice president, uh, a former vice president who would become the Democrat nominee, Joe Biden, uh, Senator Kamala Harris, who had already voted for the indictment of President Trump on a hoax trial, that is the impeachment trial. Uh, all of them came out uh, talking about uh, that this is, a totally unacceptable uh, uh, affair in, in America, that this is, a, again, throws a light on how America is a systemically racist country and that this cannot be tolerated. And the people who did what uh, Juicy Smollett claimed was done to him need to be given the full maximum uh, punishment if found guilty or then found guilty. So they all went on record even before any examination had taken place. And then what we now know is the police department in Chicago spent 3,000 valuable hour, man hour, uh, with over, you know, six figure uh, expenditure in hundreds thousands of dollars uh, trying to investigate this case um, that was basically, you know, incredulous case. Uh, and 
we also now know that there were in interference with this case at the highest level. Uh, the uh, attorney responsible, this uh, district attorney responsible, Kim Fox, a black woman, uh, uh, was was um, contacted by, according to reports, by the former first lady Michelle Obama, who knew Juicy Smollett, and you know was indicating what need to be done and what should be done, and so on and so forth, giving advice from the gallery, so to speak, uh, on, on the case. Uh, and then the case was delayed uh, because, again. Um, the police uh, chief, I, I understand, had made remarks about uh, that the story did not add up. And so the story was, uh, the case was delayed to be brought to trial. The two um, uh, people uh, accused of um, lynching or engaging to lynch um, Smollett were subsequently found to Nigerian brothers who had left the country, but then came back and, and, and gave themselves up to the police and told the police uh, in their story that they had been basically hired by Juicy Smollett. Uh, and then they had done a practice run and that uh, they had been paid by Juicy Smollett, which became again in, in, the, in the prosecution case. And, one of the evidence of the check that Juicy Smollett signed uh, to give to the to, um, uh, Nigerian brothers uh, to stage this 2 a.m. Uh, um, drama acting of uh, a lynch. Uh, all of that has come out and Juicy Smollett and his supporters still hung on hung on till the end. They're still hanging on. They're, st they're still hanging on, Salim. The, 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 the media, um, actors, the, um, the community that uh, Smollett was part of are still saying that he's innocent, even in light of all this. As a matter of fact, even in the Kyle Rittenhouse acquittal, there are elements out there, racist elements, saying that he's still a white supremacist and the people that he shot were white, you know, which they were. They were white, and he, they're, they're saying that he's a racist. I mean, even after the people have decided, it continues. Exactly. And, 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 on, the, and on the other side is, is the media, the media that has been uh, basically uh, carrying water for this, uh, this hoax. Uh, we now know that Don Lemon, um, another black man, another gay man uh, for the CNN uh, was instructing uh, Juicy Smollett uh, not to hand over his uh, camera or pictures uh, to the police that was investigating the case. I mean, this is a clear interference of a newsman or in this case, a, a media person, a celebrity uh, involved in advising a person on who's, who's, who's going into trial or what to do and not to do. And then on the other hand, sitting and reporting on the case as if the case is a true case and not a hoax, you know? So um, the involvement of the media, I mean, then and the same similar uh, is the story on the other side. I mean, you, you, talk, you, you have talked about the welfare media, the, uh, the, the Cuomo brothers, I mean, um, Chris Cuomo uh, using his platform on the CNN to uh, run with the story of his brother, Andrew Cuomo, uh, through that period uh, of COVID-19 where Andrew Cuomo, uh, Andrew Cuomo uh, policy led to this huge number of deaths of people who were moved by the instruction of Andrew Cuomo from nursing homes or from hospitals to nursing home that then infected the nursing homes and, and brought about the spike in death. New York had one of the highest 
deaths in terms of COVID-19. So I'm, I'm, I'm just reminding the people of the implication of the media and how the media has been involved in these cases of pushing the narrative uh, on, in support of the democratic agenda, the democratic agenda of systemic racism or the democratic agenda on the question of COVID in the case of uh, Andrew Cuomo. Uh, and his brother engaged in discussing with uh, or, or giving his, uh, that is Chris Cuomo, giving a platform to Andrew Cuomo to sort of whitewash his involvement on the COVID issue and demonstrate his leadership, by the way. And then on the question of Me Too, that is on the sexual harassment side, using his platform and his access to other media personalities to go and, and, and get uh, deep into the personal lives of the women who brought in the accusation of sexual harassment uh, and sexual assault uh, against the governor, then governor uh, Andrew Cuomo. So, so the media has become now, you know, we have talked about trust. There is no basis of trust anymore in media, you know. And so that is another context we need to understand or need to put on the table in seeing what these three trial and the verdict that came down illustrate or demonstrate given in this political climate of media and politics, that the people, the common people, which is what the jury pool reflected, the common people remain in the midst of this turmoil, tumult, loss of trust, and so on, remain attached to their constitutional principle, equal justice before the law. When, uh, evidence, <clears throat> evidence matter, not narrative. It is evidence. You have to weigh the evidence, irrespective of what the narrative is that the interested parties are pushing. Exactly. See, and the common people, which is the jury pool in this case, sitting on a hot seat under the glare of the media, and in so many different ways under the intimidation of Black Lives Matter, Antifa, and all the associated, what I would call the brown shirts of the Democratic Party, will not move. They maintain that their constitution is the way to navigate through all of this. In other words, I would also say that they maintain the principle that you and I have been speaking about for quite a long time of freedom based upon individual right. You are, in a, in a sense, investigating a case of an individual, irrespective of that individual's skin color, personal belief, political affiliation, or what have you. You're investigating and listening to the case and you're interested in what is the evidence or what are the evidences and not all the other wrinkles that go around it, which it comes back to the in freedom based upon individual right, equal justice before the law. The 10, the 10 amendments of the constitution, which together makes up the bill of rights, you know, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of association, and so on and so forth. Second amendment, that is the right to bear arm, which is which, which became the moot issue in the case of Kyle Rittenhouse. You know, uh, for the Democratic Party, if the the verdict had gone the other way, it would have armed them. That is the Democratic Party and all the liberal agenda of taking away the Second Amendment. The same thing is happening now with the COVID on the question of taking away the First Amendment. I mean, Anthony Fauci is on record saying that under the condition of COVID or under the condition of health-driven pandemics, the issue of freedom, individual freedom is now something that we have to revisit and we cannot accept that individual freedom. You know, So vaccine mandate and so on and so forth. 
But when it is the common people, the citizens of America, from coast to coast, if they are given an opportunity to speak on this matter, the, these three cases opens on the window and therefore the hope that there is a way out of this dilemma that we find ourselves in, at least in America, you know. We in Canada, we don't have a Bill of Rights. We don't have the First Amendment, the Second Amendment and so on. And our uh, uh, Charter of Right is, as the Charter of Right itself says, is uh, limited in the sense that, you know, it can be uh, a bridge uh, under certain conditions and, and those conditions are left for the justices to decide and for the political leaders to make the case, you know. So so we, we don't have the similar situation in America, but at least in America, we can see that that possibility is very much alive that, you know, despite all the mounting effort of um, the political elite to suspend um, the, the Charter, uh, the Bill of Rights, that has not happened. If you go back to our last conversation, um, which can be found on our YouTube channel and our Rumble channel, we talked about how the media are a filter or a window of the general populace, the general public, into events of the day, and they're fed a narrative. It's basically a filthy window, it's a dirty window through which people can only see shapes and shadows and not the real truth of what's going on beyond that window. And a court of law is like a crucible. All of the dross, all of the, the slag, all of the, the, the stuff that does not belong, all of the opinion is taken away. And what is left are facts and truths and evidence. And when the media is gotten out of the equation, it seems, for the most part, that um, the people make proper decisions when just the decisions are based on fact and evidence and truth, which, of course, leads me to conclude and should lead many people to conclude that the media are the menace of society. They are not reflective of society. They are not reflective of the truth. They are not trustworthy and that um, people should either take it with a grain of salt, much like in the Soviet Union, they read Pravda and they knew that whatever was in Pravda, the exact opposite was the case. And people should just basically turn off their darn channels and, and, and stop subscribing to these, these false narratives, these newspapers who are breeding lies and, and mistruths and, and misinformation and start to um, investigate for themselves to the best that they can. And now with computers, anybody can go and find out the truth. If it's a court case, you can find out from the court what the evidence was. If it's a statement from the government, you can actually go on YouTube or some other platform or to the government's website and find out exactly what they said. I'm reminded, for example, when President Trump was accused of several things, like saying that he said people should inject themselves with bleach. He didn't say that because people went to the actual video of his press conference to find out he didn't say that. Why are you lying to us, mainstream media? And people can come out, like I said before, in droves, in protests, and nothing is reflected in the media. I learned this when I was um, in my early political days. I would attend um, human rights tribunals and, and protests and strikes and things like that. And then I would look at the paper the next day and I'm going, this reporter wasn't even there, at least based on what I'm reading here, because this is not reflective of reality. And I think people are starting to wake up, at least I hope they are, that um, we're being fed a bunch of lies by the welfare press. Do you have anything else to conclude with, Salim? I mean, just in conclusion, I mean, your point uh, that you're making uh, uh, brought to mind that in both the Rittenhouse case and in the Arbery case, it was the private uh, uh, video that is shot by private citizens, not by the media, 
that became the crucial evidence in the case, that in the case of uh, Arbery, it was the video um, that went viral eventually, which forced the Bureau of Investigation to take away the case from the local prosecutor and the local police of force, you know, and the attorney general got involved in, 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 in Georgia and, and we see the result. And that, that was a cr critical evidence that, that could have been buried or would not have seen the light of the day. Media again fail to investigate or to look into this matter. Yeah. In the case of Kyle Wright, um, Rittenhouse, it was the same situation. I mean, in, in, in that case, the, the video uh, shot by um, a handheld camera or, 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 or an iPhone or an Android um, was the, 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 the film of, from that, that uh, uh, camera was being held back by the FBI. Uh, and the authority, the prosecutor, they didn't want to release it till, you know, the defense forcefully got that matter released by, uh, to the judge. Uh, and, and there you have it. I mean, um, why was the prosecutor trying to not allow that video to come out? You know, and, and that's the that's question. Uh, and again, the media failed to report it and the media failed to carry the story because again, the narrative was more important than the actual ev evidence. And it is the evidence that tipped the scale. And so uh, uh, where we are today, and, and in, in Canada, this is the situation and this is the situation in, in, in Europe and Australia and New Zealand that the mainstream media has become one window. The whole idea of freedom of speech, freedom of press was the multiplicity where each would be open to question, challenge and, and present, uh, whether it be the narrative or whether it be the evidence, but present the whole story, you know? We talk about truth, nothing but the truth uh, and, and all of the truth. So to present that, that has now been in so many different ways eviscerated. So what we have, we might have the globe and the, and the, and the national post, the CBC and the global and so on and so forth, the, the alphabet soup as in the American system, but it is all one window. That's where we have arrived at, you know. Uh, yes, so we have the technology, but, you know, he, here we are, we were using the technology, you and I, but we don't have access to the public as the way the mainstream media still has the acts. And so that leads to the, to the immense problem of where we have landed ourselves as a people, as a state, is that the media can contaminate the general population with a narrative. And it is then an immensely difficult mountain to climb to show the huge chunks of problem with that narrative, which is, you know, if you're going to dispute the narrative and if you're going to defeat the narrative, because, you know, we might suspect that there are other things equally, if not more important, that needs to be said. So here we have the COVID situation, we're going through uh, this terrible circumstance of vaccine mandate and masking and social distancing and the ruin that has brought to our lives and our economy and so on and so forth. Uh, we are all being contaminated by that one big window of the media. Whereas if, if the media was truly open, we would have been able to get alternative viewpoints, alternative arguments on the table, compelling the politician to pay attention to those alternatives and not be able to, in this way, dictate and mandate one uh, uh, prescription or one remedy that favors certain group of people that we know who they are, whether it's the big pharma, whether it's the oligarch, and whether it's the one person elite around the world. Well said, Salim, and thank you again for your insight. Thank you.